Our top story this Thursday, Arizona Republican Senator Martha McSally revealed she was sexually assaulted while serving in the Air Force. Now the Air Force is responding. CBS's Laura Podesta reports. And in one case, I was preyed upon and then raped by a superior officer. At a Senate hearing yesterday on sexual assault in the military, Senator Martha McSally described how she was sexually assaulted more than once during her 26-year career in the U.S. Air Force. I was ashamed and confused. I thought I was strong, but felt powerless. The Arizona Republican was the first woman to fly in combat as a fighter pilot. She said she didn't report the assaults when they happened because she didn't trust the system. She's going public now with hope her story will lead to reform. In January, the Defense Department found the number of service academy cadets reporting unwanted sexual encounters increased almost 50 percent over the last three years. I share the disgust of the failures of the military system and many commanders who failed in their responsibilities. Now the Air Force is responding, saying it is appalled and deeply sorry at what McSally describes. The statement goes on to say the criminal actions described by McSally violate every part of what it means to be an airman. Laura Podesta, CBS News. Senator McSally spoke exclusively to CBS This Morning's co-host, Nora O'Donnell. That interview will be airing this morning. Singer R. Kelly was taken into custody Wednesday after a family court hearing in Chicago. The Cook County Sheriff's Office says Kelly owes his ex-wife $161,000 in child support. The development follows his explosive interview with Gail King on CBS This Morning. It was his first interview since his arrest on sexual abuse charges last month. He called the allegations lies. Jeopardy host Alex Trebek says he has advanced pancreatic cancer. Trebek, who is 78, says his prognosis is not encouraging, but he plans to keep working. Trebek became the host of Jeopardy in 1984. Closer to home as thousands of Montanans receive nursing home care, Senator Steve Daines is discussing challenges within the industry. A new report suggests a high rate of nursing home closures in rural America, and Montana's senior population is growing despite a decline in nursing homes. The Senate Finance Committee discussed telemedicine access to rural communities during a hearing on Capitol Hill Wednesday, and they also discussed transparency in care. Danes highlighted a case in Lewistown where a nursing home failed to protect patients from abuse. According to reports, on 13 occasions, officials were not notified of incidents that included abuse in the facility's wing, which houses dementia patients. As part of the investigation, one staff member said they had not been trained on how to help manage resident behaviors. Uh, these kind of reports uh, are saddening, they're concerning, particularly as these patients are some of the most vulnerable Montanans who are receiving mental health and long-term care services. The Lewistown facility was forced to pay over $250,000 in fines after abuse surfaced. Meanwhile, the gray wolf could soon be taken off the endangered species list entirely. Acting Interior Secretary David Bernhardt announced that a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proposed rule would delist the gray wolf and return management to the states and tribes. In 2011, the gray wolf was delisted in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and parts of Washington, Oregon, and Utah. This plan would delist the animal in all lower 48 states. A U.S. Fish and Wildlife spokesman says recovery of the gray wolf under the Endangered Species Act is one of our nation's greatest conservation successes. A group opposed to delisting sent a statement saying, on its face, this appears to be politically motivated. We look forward to taking the Fish and Wildlife Service to court should its proposal not be based on what the science tells us. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also proposed a delisting rule during the Obama administration. The proposed rule will be open for public comment after it's published in the Federal Register.
Glacier National Park is addressing crowding and congestion concerns along going to the Sun Road. The park has seen a drastic increase in visitation with over 3.3 million people visiting in 2017, so a plan will be unveiled. It includes timed parking spots at Logan Pass, more protection for frequently visited trails, and expanding the shuttle system. This spring, the public will be asked for public comment. A new public hot spring is popping up just 10 minutes from Yellowstone National Park, and the property is home to a storied past. Yellowstone Hot Springs gave locals a first look at the facility on Wednesday. The water comes in at 70,000 gallons an hour. The management team says opening is a dream come true with support from the Gardner community. The hot spring sits at the Royal Teton Ranch, home to Church Universal and Triumphant. Back in the 80s, the church's leader urged followers to prepare for the end of the world by building underground bunkers. When their leader died in 2009, church membership fell. The grand opening is this Friday. Well, tonight is the night. Q2 will take you into the Billings St. Jude Dream Home for the very first time. This comes as half of the tickets for the Dream Home are already sold. The winner has the chance to win a brand new home valued at $500,000. Be sure to watch tonight's 530 News for an inside look. We'll also host a sellathon here at Q2 tomorrow evening, so you have a chance to call in and buy your ticket before the next early bird prize deadline. You can visit ktvq.com slash St. Jude for a full list of early bird prizes, and you can also find a link there to buy a ticket online. The proceeds go to children looking for medical care and cures. As MTN's Janelle Slade shows us, each medical discovery is shared with the world. He loves people, so he, he has enjoyed, he enjoys coming here because he gets to see so many people. And he doesn't remember the sick parts, does he? No, he doesn't. He doesn't no. remember being sick. No, and I am thankful for that. But Erica remembers. Just weeks after baby Luke was born, the concern of hereditary eye cancer had this mom asking questions. They wouldn't give them answers. And although doctors in Colorado assured her Luke was just fine, her gut didn't give up. A little persistence and pushing eventually produced her worst fears, retinoblastoma, tumors in both of Luke's eyes. It was scary, emotional. I was worried. Erica says she didn't get angry. She was certainly scared, but the medical teams at St. Jude had answers and sought alternative solutions. They felt like it wasn't responding like it should, so they kind of adjusted it to where he was doing the laser treatment and the chemo at the same time, and fortunately that combination did work for him. Everything that we learn about every tumor is helping someone somewhere, maybe at St. Jude, maybe not, figure out how to better treat that tumor and how to get rid of it for good for any kid that would happen to have it. That mindset is not just part of the difference that sets St. Jude apart, it's also the mission that goes on every day behind every wall on this campus. Nothing that we do at St. Jude is proprietary. We don't have any secrets. If we find something that works, we want everyone to use it because we aren't interested in making ourselves big or making our name big. We're interested in curing cancer for every kid in the world. Within 72 hours, scientists here can come up with a protocol, send it across the street for manufacturing, and have it at the bedside of a sick child, potentially easing their symptoms or even curing their cancer. As soon as we learn something, we are publishing it and sharing it, and scientists all over the world are taking our ideas, not only our cures, but anything that we find. So kids like Luke can see the world and keep on loving people. Janelle Slade, MTN News. Janelle tells us Luke goes back to St. Jude every six months for checkups. And it just so happens his doctor is from Montana. Dr. Rachel Brennan was born and raised in Helena. She attended Capitol High School, then Carroll College, and much of her family still lives in Helena.